Will you please pray with me? God, we ask that it is you that we hear and feel in these words and in this place. Please fill us with your spirit and inspire us to serve you. Amen. So we've talked about seeking Christ. And I pray that you all are seeking Christ in your lives. And we've talked about sharing Christ and not being ashamed of your faith and showing others and sharing Christ in the way that you live. But today we're going to take it another step. Seeking sounds good. Sharing sounds not too hard. Today we're going to talk about serving. Serving is that, that work. It's the hard stuff that we have to do. How do we serve Christ? When Tara and I first moved back to Ohio from Tennessee, I didn't have a job. We came back early in the summer because Tara was offered a position at a nonprofit uh, for the summer, and we needed to try to find housing in Cleveland before Tara started graduate school um, at Case Western Reserve before uh, in August. And it would have been really tough to find housing living in Nashville and try to find housing in Cleveland. So we moved in with their parents for a little while. They helped us out so that we could find some housing. I had just graduated with my Master's of Divinity from Vanderbilt Divinity School, and yet even with that awesome title, I could not find a job at first. I wasn't yet ordained. Um, so I was hunting for any job that I could find, anything to fill the time. I started lining up some pulpit supply opportunities, but I needed something more. Pulpit supply doesn't pay that well, um, and I needed something more than just writing sermons during the week. I had to do something else. So I started taking any jobs I could find. And I spoke with this lady that I played music with at another church. And she told me that she made extra money by working through a catering company. They would do big events and they'd have to hire on extra caterers and servers. And so she would get uh, called for those. And she asked if I would be interested in doing that. So it was late May when she told me they were going to be needing help at a big event in August, and I told her I would do it. As the summer went along, I started working for a landscaping company. I did pulpit supply nearly every Sunday, and I started having serious discussions with a church that was interested in calling me. And Tara, Tara and I took advantage of being home with our families after three years away, and we went to a lot of family events. And through all of this, I stopped checking my emails. And so some late summer day, Tara and I were with her family at a park when I received a phone call from this lady that I played music with. And on the other line, she was very frantic, and she said, Stephen, where are you? Um, I'm at a park. Why? And she was very confused. She wanted to know why I was at this park, and I told her uh, that I was there with Tara's family, and that we were having a good time. And she said back to me, you're supposed to be at the lot. We're all packing up and leaving to go to the wedding. I told them that they could count on you, and you're not here. And I was too far away and not wearing black slacks with a white shirt to make it in time. That's happened to all of us, right? We've all filled our schedules to the point that we forget things. We've all overcommitted ourselves and then try and either work our way out of it or eventually having to drop something. We've all spent time serving multiple masters. But we don't have to. And we shouldn't. And we'd be a lot better off if we reevaluated our lives and chose one master to serve. God. A few chapters into the Gospel of Matthew, there's a very famous sermon given by Jesus. Does anybody know what that sermon's called? Yeah, the Sermon on the Mount. It starts with the Beatitudes, and then Jesus starts doing all these sayings. It's very famous, and some of them really stick with us, and they're hard for us uh, to, to figure out. And today we're going to read one of those texts that kind of plagues many of us. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. For a slave will either hate the one and love the other, 
or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. That's hard for us to hear. We need money. Maybe God doesn't know all the bills that I have on my counter at home. We need money to get on with our day, to go on with life. And yet here Jesus is very simply saying, you cannot serve both God and wealth. So we must ask, what is wealth? The Greek word in this text is mammon. Some translations even leave it as that, mammon. And mammon is just a Greek spelling of an Aramaic word, which means riches. Jesus is saying you can't serve both God and riches. But there are many ways to be rich. We normally think of money, but we don't have to just be rich in money, right? The idea behind wealth and riches is that to accumulate them, it takes time, it takes energy, and it takes focus. It takes more things than that, but those are the big three that it really takes. You need to devote time to something, you need to devote energy, and you need to be focused on it to be able to gain wealth or riches in it. Time, energy, and focus, these are the very things needed to follow God. That's what it means to be committed to something. In pursuing earthly wealth, we cast aside God. If we're spending all of our time, all of our energy, all of our focus, everything we're doing is about getting money so we can succeed here, then we're casting aside God. Our choices are serve God or serve self. We cannot do both. We try, but we fail. However, Jesus does comfort us by following up this portion of his sermon with another well-known text. He continues in his sermon by saying, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. Your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than they? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. Even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? Your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, but strive first for the kingdom of God. And all these things will be given to you as well. Strive first for God's kingdom. Serve God. And we will be taken care of. We can't serve two masters. We can't serve self and God. However, if we serve God, everything else will start to fall into place. But we can't do it on our own. The whole community must serve God for us to be taken care of. So how do we serve Christ here? We need to be serving together. We'll talk about ways that we serve Christ. We need to be serving together. If a group of us moves one way and another group pushes in the opposite direction, then we'll get nowhere. So we must have trust in our leadership that they can and will guide us down God's path. But it's hard to have trust in others when we're serving. We want to do it ourselves many times or at least give our input on what should be done. When I accepted the call to come here, there was one part that I was more nervous about than any, and that was Chris. I had never had a secretary before. I didn't know what she would be like, uh, how we would work together. And on my very first day, I showed up to move some stuff into my office, and it was the first time I got to meet Chris in person, and I quickly realized that she was just as nervous about me as I was about her. Later, she told me. She was afraid I'd come in and say, oh, you're old, we have to get rid of you. <laughs> Over the next couple of weeks, we came to an understanding that we could work together, we could serve together, and now I think that some of the best ministry done here flows straight through her office. 
She is a sounding board, a filter, an editor, a colleague in ministry, and so much more. We serve together. But I hear horror stories of other pastors who have staff that push against them, and instead of serving Christ, they spend all their time bickering and undermining each other. We need to serve together to be successful. The scripture we heard from Malachi speaks to the need of serving God together. In that text, God is angry at Israel for them not giving to God. They've held back their tithe. They've served self. They chose a different master. They overfilled their calendar to the point that there's no room for God. So God gets angry. And in that text, God says to them in Malachi, Will anyone rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how are we robbing you? In your tithes and offerings, you are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse so there may be food in my house, and thus put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you an overflowing blessing. It's easy for us to hear this text and say, God speaking to Israel many, 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 many years ago. But I believe in a living scripture, and so this text is revealing something to us today. So hear it again. Will anyone rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how are we robbing you? In your tithes and offerings, you are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole congregation of you. Bring the full tithe into the sanctuary so that there may be food in my house and thus put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you an overflowing blessing. This text isn't just to Israel, it's to us. We hold back from God our tithes and offerings again and again in our lives because we try to serve self. We pick a different master. To serve God means to give to God. It means to seek God. It means to share God. It means to discern God's call. And of course, it means to act on that call, to follow. So again, I ask you, how do we serve Christ? There are many of us here who do serve and serve faithfully, but it takes the whole congregation because we are all tasked with bringing an offering before God. It's all of us who are asked to serve. Over the last year, many of you have been giving financially so that we can continue to serve Christ in this place. And not only have you been giving, but we've been exceeding our pledges in giving. I don't know if any of you have ever noticed this board before when you come in. This was a board that the finance committee came up with last year to kind of show us and remind us of where we are for our pledges. And at the end of every month, we would tape up the amount. We've, we divided up the whole chalice, figured out how much each section was worth, so that at the end of every month, we could tape up the amount that we gave that month. And you can see that in January, we fell so far behind that we didn't even get January on our first taping. But as the year progressed, we overcame. Here we are in November, and at the end of October, we have already exceeded our pledges through November. I'm not telling you this so that you can say, oh, good, now I have more Christmas spending money. <laughs> I don't have to give now. No, it's because we're doing good ministry here, and we think that it's good, and we want to give back to God, and as we give back to God, we are given more blessings and more opportunities to continue to serve. My hope is that next year, if we do a visualization, we'll see it fill up even faster. And the year after that, even faster, because we will want to continue to give to God so that we have more opportunities to serve Christ in this place. This is amazing that we're exceeding giving. I think it's actually, why don't we all clap for one another and celebrate that fact. But it's not just about giving money. It's about changing our attitude on what it means to serve Christ. We heard in 1 Peter that to be able to serve, we have to rid ourselves of all malice, all guile, all insecurity, envy, and all slander. 
We have to change ourselves to be able to serve. And it's great the stuff we're doing, but we can do more. Did you know that in Stark County, there are nearly 1,500 homeless and near homeless people? Just Stark County, 1,500. Nearly half, I think it's 46%, nearly half of all the children enrolled in Stark County public schools get a free or reduced lunch. And that's great that that program exists for when they're at school. But what about the days where there isn't any school and there isn't any food in their homes? Our county averages over 400 inmates a day in our county jail. And our sheriff's office boasts that it feeds these men on barely over a dollar per meal. How about you go a week only spending a dollar per meal and see how you feel? And it boasts that it's working toward finding a way to legally charge them for their incarceration, for their stay in the jail. So how do we serve Christ? We can't serve two masters, and Jesus tells us very clearly to feed the hungry, visit the imprisoned, stand with the oppressed, and fight against injustice. And we can't do that by just giving money. We have to be active in our service. God has blessed all of us in this room with so much, and I ask, how will you respond to this blessing? Will you withhold your tithes and offerings, or will you give freely? In one week, we will be asking for your commitment to serve Christ in this place for 2015. If we choose to serve God in Christ, then we become servants of God. And as such, we should heed the words from 1 Peter. As servants of God live as free people, yet do not use your freedom as a pretext for evil. Honor everyone. How do we serve Christ? The answer to that question is up to you for 2015 and beyond in this place. Amen.